the decline and fall of work. In an industrial society which confuses work and productivity, the necessity of producing has always been an enemy of the desire to create. What spark of humanity, of possible creativity, can remain alive in a being dragged out of sleep at six every morning, jolted about in suburban trains, deafened by the racket of machinery, bleached and steamed by meaningless sounds and gestures, spun dry by statistical controls, and tossed out at the end of the day into the entrance halls of railway stations, those cathedrals of departure for the hell of weekdays and the purgatory paradise of weekends, where the crowd communes in a brutish weariness. From adolescence to retirement, each 24-hour cycle repeats the same shattering bombardment like bullets hitting a window, mechanical repetition, time which is money, submission to bosses, boredom, exhaustion. From the crushing of youth's energy to the gaping wound of old age, life cracks in every direction under the blows of forced labor. Never before has a civilization reached such a degree of contempt for life. Never before has a generation, drowned in mortification, felt such a rage to live. The same people who are murdered slowly in, in the mechanized slaughterhouses of work are also arguing, singing, drinking, dancing, making love, taking to the streets, picking up weapons and inventing a new poetry. Already the front against forced labor is forming. Its gestures of refusal are molding the consciousness of the future. Every call for productivity under the conditions chosen by capitalist and Soviet economics is a call to slavery. That it is necessary to produce is so obvious a fact that even a hack like Jean Fautissier can easily fill a dozen tunes with proofs of it. Unfortunately for neopolitical economists, the proofs they adduce are 19th century ones, harking back to a time when the misery of the working classes made the right to work analogous to the right to slavery, as claimed from the dawn of time by prisoners about to be massacred. Above all, it was a question of surviving, of not disappearing physically. The imperatives of production are the imperatives of survival. From now on, people want to live, not just survive. The tripalium is an instrument of torture. In Latin, the word labor means suffering. We are unwise to forget the origins of the words travail and labor. At least the nobility never forgot their own dignity and the indignity which marked their bondsmen. The aristocratic contempt for work reflected the master's contempt for the dominated classes. Work was the expatiation to which they were condemned for all eternity by the divine decree which had willed them, for impenetrable reasons, to be inferior. Work took its place among the sanctions of providence as the punishment for poverty, and, because it was the means to a future salvation, such a punishment could take on the attributes of pleasure. Basically, though, work was less important than submission. The bourgeoisie does not dominate, it exploits. It does not need to be master, it prefers to use. Why has nobody seen that the principle of productivity simply replaced the principle of feudal authority? Why has nobody wanted to understand this? Is it because work ameliorates the human condition and saves the poor, at least in illusion, from maternal damnation? Undoubtedly, but today it seems that the carrot of happier tomorrows has smoothly replaced the carrot of salvation in the next world. In both cases, the present is always under the heel of oppression. Is it because work transforms nature? Yes, but what can I do with a nature ordered in terms of profit and loss, a world where the inflation of techniques conceals the deflation of the use value of life? Besides, just as the sexual act is not intended to procreate, but makes children by accident, organized labor transforms the surface of continents as a byproduct, not a purpose. Work to transform the world? Bullshit. The world is being transformed in the direction prescribed by the existence of forced labor, which is why it is being transformed so badly. Perhaps man realizes himself through his forced labor. In the 19th century, the concept of work retained a vestige of the notion of creativity. Zola describes a nailsmith's contest in which the workers competed in the perfection of their tiny masterpiece. Love of the trade and the vitality of already smothered creativity incontestably helped 15 hours of effort, which nobody could have stood if some kind of pleasure had not slipped in. The survival of the craft conception allowed each worker to contrive a precarious comfort in the hell of the factory. But Taylorism dealt the death blow to a mentality which had been carefully fostered by archaic capitalism. It is useless to expect even a caricature of creativity from the conveyor belt. Nowadays, ambition and the love of the job, well done, are the indelible mark of defeat and submission. Which is why, wherever submission is demanded, the stale fart of ideology makes headway, from the Arbeit und of the concentration camps to the homilies of Henry Ford and Mao Tse. So what is the function of forced labor? The myth of power exercised jointly by a master and God drew its course at first from the unity of the feudal system. Destroying the unitary myth, the fragmented power of the bourgeoisie inaugurated under the flag of crisis, the reign of ideologies, which can never attain, separately or together, a fraction of the efficiency of men. The dictatorship of productive work stepped into the breach. Its mission is to weaken the majority of people physically, to castrate and stupefy them collectively, and so make them receptive to the feeblest, 
least virile, most senile ideology in the entire history of falsehood. Most of the proletariat at the beginning of the 19th century had been physically diminished, systematically broken by the torture of the workshop. Revolts came from artisans, from privileged or unemployed groups, not from workers shattered by 15 hours of labor. Significantly, the reduction of working time came just when the ideological variety show produced by consumer society seemed able to provide an effective replacement for the feudal myths destroyed by the young bourgeoisie. People really have worked for a refrigerator, a car, a television set. Many still do, and fight it as they are to consume the passivity and the empty time that the necessity of production offers them. Statistics published in 1938 indicated that the use of most modern technology would reduce necessary working time to three hours a day. Not only are we a long way off with our seven hours, but after wearing our generation of workers by promising them the happiness which is sold today on the installment plan, the bourgeoisie and its Soviet equivalent pursue man's destruction outside the workshop. Tomorrow they will deck out the five hours of necessary wear and tear with a time of creativity which will grow just as fast as they can fill it with the impossibility of creating anything, the famous leisure explosion. It has been quite correctly said that, quote, China faces gi gigantic economic problems. For her, productivity is a matter of life and death, end quote. Nobody would dream of denying it. What seems important to me is not the economic imperatives, but the manner of responding to them. The Red Army in 1917 was a new kind of organization. The Red Army of the 1960s is an army such as is found in capitalist countries. Events have shown that its effectiveness remains far below the potential of a revolutionary militia. In the same way, the planned Chinese economy, by refusing to allow federated groups to organize, organize their work autonomously, condemns itself to becoming another example of the perfected form of capitalism called socialism. Has anyone bothered to study the approaches to work of primitive peoples, the importance of play and creativity, the incredible yield obtained by methods which the application of modern technology would make a hundred times more efficient? Obviously not. Every appeal for productivity comes from above, but only creativity is spontaneously rich. It is not from, quote, productivity that a full life is to be expected. It is not, quote, productivity that will produce an enthusiastic response to economic needs.